We're turning back the Datages clock to one of our early Datages with today's interview. Stick around and hit the rewind button with us today. You know, when I was your age, go ask your mother. I know you don't like it. It builds character. How many times do I have to tell you? I'm not just talking to hear my own voice. Hello, listener, and welcome to Datages. I'm your host, Chad Hagel. And if you are looking for some fatherly wisdom for your career, your family, or any other aspect of your life, then you've come to the right place. If you want to learn more about Datages, find additional content, submit questions, or feedback to me, visit datages.com. Thanks for being here. And before you listen to our podcast, please listen to your father. Friends and family, welcome back to Datages. So what's today's datage? Today's adage is, it takes credit to make money. And today we're fortunate enough to be joined by Charlie Einsman. Charlie is a fellow real estate investor and the co-author of the book, Roadmap to Wealth, Real Estate Investing, along with his two business partners, Sam Jacknan and Ed Grass. Charlie, welcome to Dadages. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I look forward to, uh, you know, I look forward to telling some, some really good dad jokes. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Hold on for that. We'll get to that. Okay. But we're looking forward to it. Thanks for coming prepared in that regard. That's funny. So Charlie, I'm really excited to have you in the Datages virtual studio and to be talking shop with you about making money in real estate. One of my favorite topics, obviously. And as I said up front, the Datage that we're covering today is one of my favorites. It takes credit to make money. But I'd really like to start with what was our very first dadage, which is surround yourself with people who are better than you are at what they do best and let them do it. You've really taken this approach to heart and lived it out. You've not only built a team in your real estate business, you actually took a team approach to writing the book as well. Charlie, tell us about your your team and, and how you guys have used your teamwork to make the dream work, as you said in the book, in your real estate ventures and in your writing. Yeah, well, that was one of the key things is that before COVID happened, we actually had the manuscript of the book already written. Wow. And so one of the things that uh, we wanted to do is we didn't want to make it into a boring real estate book, right? And so what happened was as part of the team, uh, Ed Grass being a, a litigation litigation attorney helped us with it. But the problem with when you get a litigator to help you write a book, he's used to writing serious briefs for different levels of court. Yeah. And so it was very challenging for him. And the other, my other partner- You had to take all out all of the whereases and the therefores. Exactly. And so my other partner, Sam, was an MBA and, and me of the group, even though I had written most of the manuscript, they always used to tell me, you have a sixth grade writing level. Oh. You write as if you talk, which I do, because if you look at one of my emails, I write my emails as if I'm talking. And so that was interesting. So then what we did is we actually hired a ghostwriter to help us uh-huh. actually, once the manuscript was done, to help us actually flesh it out, make it a little bit more fun, right? With with more yeah, adages yeah. as dadages. So, yeah, we, course, so we had a lot more quotes. We had a lot more stories. Um, and she made it a little bit more fun and funny. Yeah. And so I think yeah. that makes it hopefully a, a very good read. But actually, you know, our book is basically our story. And so as far as building teams were concerned on the real estate side, we literally started building teams from day one. So even if it was uh, fixing and flipping houses, uh, whether it was our rental portfolio, you know, we started building really successful teams from day one. And one of the team members that we have to this day is a general contractor who started out as an electrician. So he was a master electrician. And then once we did our second or third flip, we're like, hey, uh, Mauricio, can you can you do this uh, renovation for us and do all the trades, do the plumbing, do the electrical, you know, do the drywall, do everything for us? And he thought about it and he literally created his general contracting company around our fix and flips. That's pretty awesome. That's really a great story. And I loved reading about that because, you know, I always tell people as much as I enjoy building buildings, I enjoy even more building organizations and teams and building people. And that's what you did with Mauricio is you gave him the opportunity to take a step up in his own life and have a greater, a higher line of sight. And I think that's really amazing that, that you were able to do that. It's fantastic. No, and it gets even a little better than that. The best part of this is that we've had a 20 year relationship, maybe more. And what we do every single year is that Mauricio has a Christmas party 
and he invites all of his workers that work for him now. And so now his company is up to like 20 people. He's got some subs in case he has to expand or contract. So the 20 guys, uh, they're there. They're at the party every year. And so one of the things that we do, myself and Sam, is we show up with a bunch of gift cards for his employees. And, and a lot of these guys have been around for 20 years plus, and we've had, we have relationships with them. We have relationships with their families. You know, we know their kids. And so it's a really nice event and we get to share their advantages and advances in life with our advan advances in our business. And so that's really, that's really pretty touching for us. Yeah. Such a great way to pay it forward. That's really awesome. And obviously doing that, you know, from a self-interested perspective, you know, let's not forget there's a business benefit yeah. too. You're helping those people be totally aligned and totally loyal to you going forward. And I think that's the beauty of uh, really being able to take care of people in that way is it just creates stronger bonds and greater opportunities for everyone. Well, that's true. And, and, and you know, we always say this the whole time we say, you know, the roadmap is one thing, right? Making the money and getting to the end is one thing. The best part of the roadmap are the relationships you make along the way. Because at the end of the day, what do we have, right? We have our relationships, whether it's friends, family, in our case, our workers or general contractors. You know, we have every, friends and family too, right? And that's what we have. We have a reputation. Can I trust this guy? Can I not? If somebody mentions my name and I'm not there, what is that other person going to say? You know, that's what we have. And so for us, um, that's really the most important thing for us. Yeah, relationship and reputation. Uh, I always say that business, any business, but particularly I've found the real estate business is really about two things, relationships and performance. And the first one of those is by far the most important. And that's, that's fantastic. And, you know, going back to the book, I, I think it was great that, you know, you guys had this team approach to writing the book as well. And it really came through in the book that the, the collaboration was very apparent. And, you know, I'll have to disagree, by the way, with your, your two partners, respectfully. I think writing as you speak is actually a great talent. And I think it makes for something that's more approachable and that people can really enjoy. And especially I listen to it on audiobook format, download it from Audible, get a plug in for you there. And, and I really feel like there's a convergence of media these days. I mean, what we're doing right now, podcasting, it's a form of content creation. And I think the written word and the spoken word are really blending together in a way that people just interact with content. They don't choose to watch it, listen to it, or read it. It's just engage with it. And so I think that your writing style and the way you presented the book is fantastic. And uh, I would encourage you to keep doing more of the same. Well, thank you for saying that, because one of the things that we sort of realized, and you understand this too, is that how do people connect with you? They connect with you because they want to hear your stories. They might not necessarily want to hear what you have to say writing-wise, but as long as you can tell some stories that they can relate to you, that's what it takes. Because one of the things I do is I talk to a bunch of investment organizations, meetups, investor associations, clubs, groups, whatever you want to call it. And the best part, in my presentations, I might have, let's say, 30 minutes. I'll tell somebody, I said, look, I can't cover this subject in 30 minutes. I said, it's probably going to be closer to an hour, hour and a half. I said, at least give me an extra 15, 20 minutes so I can get there. Because one of the things that always happens is I end up telling stories. And so even though I'm covering some material and they get it, by me telling stories, it further enhances their learning ability. And I really appreciate that. And what it does is it glues them to me, right? They like this guy. I'm a likable guy. And what I do is I talk down to their level. Again, that's that sixth grade writing level, even sixth grade talking level is people say, oh, well, you presented this thing in such an easy way. Now I can understand it. But then I've got to back up and I've got to caveat it. I said, yeah, I might have explained it and made it look easy, but in all actuality, Reality is it's not easy and this is what you got to do. Well, and, and that's one of the things that I've observed about the real estate industry, generally speaking as well, is as much as there's a level of institutionalization and sophistication that is continuing to grow in the industry, at the end of the day, it's still a pretty dumb industry. And if you're talking to a sixth grade level, you're probably already talking over the majority of your audience. You got to bring it down to about kindergarten from, from what I've seen. Oh no, that's, yeah, that's absolutely true. And you know, one of the things that we always say, whether it's a fix and flip, whether it's a buy and hold, we say, guys, this is nothing but a math problem. Okay. And as far as one of your expenses, especially if you're going to fix and flip a house, please make your profit one of the expenses so that you make sure you make money. And all this is a math problem. You just got to buy right. Yeah. Well, that's one of the other things I always tell people is they ask me as a commercial developer, well, Chad, what does that mean? And the only answer I've ever really been able to come up with is it's my job to make everyone else in the world happy. And if I have any money left over at the end of the day, I did my job well. 
So that's that line, squeezing my profit in at the very bottom of the pro forma. It's the last line of the entire pro forma for sure. And usually the one that gets the least amount of attention. Well, Charlie, great talking about the, the subject of the book, but let's turn more to a discussion about your business, Clear Sky, which is not just a single company now, but as I understand, it's actually a whole group of companies. Can you share how your business has evolved over the years and uh, share for, with the friends and family what the full scope of what you're doing now with your partners? Well, what I can tell you how it did not evolve is that we did not have a business plan. We did not have something that the MBAs, you know, the Harvards of the world, the Pens of the world, the UVAs of the world, the University of Virginia, we never had a business plan. One of the things that we knew that we wanted to do is that we were realtors first, right? I was an engineer. I got an engineering degree. So I was working the normal nine to five. I had, you know, made a lot of money doing that. I uh, had great credit, but we were, Sam and myself were both realtors from the investment side first, mm -hmm. right? But we knew that one of the things that we wanted to do first of all, was fix and flip houses. Because one of the things that I was really good at was, I remember one of the books that my mom had sent me in college was gold mining and foreclosures. So I was really good at the um, pre-foreclosure space. Okay. You know, when a trustee sale ad comes out in the newspaper, back in the day, newspapers, right, guys? <laughs> Nobody reads those anymore. But we were canvassing the uh, papers for trustee sale ads. We were identifying the properties that had equity that didn't have equity. And so we were basically knock, literally knocking on doors to see if we can help out with their financial problems. But it wasn't just that we were preying on these guys to fix and flip and buy their houses. We actually had three options for them. So we would show up, we would say, okay, number one, uh, because we're realtors, we'll just go ahead and put your house on the MLS, the multiple listing service and sell it for you. Number two, we could do what's called a lend -in list if provided the property had enough equity. We actually would give owners money Give them not an advance only, on the value yes, of the house. Yeah, that's right. We would give them an advance to not only bring the property current, because remember, they're in pre-foreclosure, so they're behind, yeah. but we would also give them an advance to renovate their house so that when we put it on the multiple listing service, it would be a top-notch listing. Yeah. So we yeah. called that program the Lend and List. And of course, a third thing that we would give them the option was that we would go ahead and give them an all-cash as-is option right now, free rent for 30, 60 days. And so that's how we got started in the fix and flip space. Yeah, and that story is so consistent with what I've seen as a recipe for success in the real estate industry, which is focusing on being of service. Of if course. you're just focusing on, as you said, a, a business plan, you guys didn't have a business plan. No. You were just showing up and trying to solve a problem, provide a service and meet a need. That's right. And at the end of the day, that's the very best business plan you could possibly come up with. Well, not only that, but we learned very early on, like you just said, the financial distress of the house is only one of many, many problems. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to solve, okay, well, I've got bad credit. I'm moving. I need to yeah. maybe get into a rental. How am I going to do that with bad credit? Okay, well, we're going to do that. We're going to find you a place and we're going to pay six months in advance for the rent. We're going to show you how you're going to get into a rental. Well, I don't have a moving company. I need to move this stuff, whether I whether we give them three months of storage or whether we just move it from A to B. Well, we had the guys for that. My son is graduating from high school or the school doesn't end. School year doesn't end until May or June. I'm in February. Can I stay here until June until my kids get out of school and I have an easier transition. And so nine times out of 10, there were more problems than the house itself. And so if you could solve every one of their problems, what that did for us is that build, that built a lot of trust. Yeah. And so even if anybody else came to talk to them and tried to put on their salesman hat, they were never going to go anywhere else because they really liked us and they really trusted us. And so, yeah, we, and there's no way no anyone else would be crazy enough to offer the full right. suite of services right. and problem solving that you were. I, I'm getting this right. impression that th these four words have never come across your lips, which is that's not my job. And they, I think right. that that's, that's right. so important in real estate. Never. Yeah. Yeah. That not only that, that's not my job. Or the other word that never came out of our mouth was either I can't or no. And that's always been, that's always been our, the backbone of our life. Okay. Well, what does one no mean? Okay. Well, one no means that the opportunity is closer. Okay. Let's go get another no. Let me go get 98 more no's because eventually at the end of that no, there is going to be a yes. It's a fantastic attitude and approach for sure. Yeah. But then what happened was we were fixing and flipping so many houses that we were like, oh my gosh, getting crushed on taxes. Uh, poor baby. Right. And then what we had to do is we decided that, okay, we're going to keep some of these houses and put them away in a rental portfolio. And so at the time we had six uh, rental properties and this is right before the 2008, 2009 bank crash. So we had six uh, rentals in our portfolio at that point. 
So now we're three pronged. We're real estate agents. Now I'm full time because I left my real estate, my uh, engineering consulting job yeah. before that. So now we're real estate agents getting normal commissionable income. We now fix and flip houses. Now we have just started our six townhouse, single family house rental portfolio. Then what happened was the 2008 9 bank crash happened where all the houses got foreclosed on because I don't know if you remember, do you remember the Nina loans? No income, no asset verification. Of course. Where everybody could just get the option arm loans. Yeah. We called them the broken arm loans at the time. They had the four options. They could pay negative amortization. They could pay interest only. They could pay a, pay a 30 year amortization schedule or 15. So we called them broken arms. So because of the foreclosure crisis, our six townhouse, single family house portfolio. Remember, I bought them at 70 cents of the market value. And then we had a rental portfolio loan of 70% of that. So we, so the bank owed, we owed the bank 50% of what these properties were worth. But because of the crash, the uh, values went down so fast, like, like, especially around me. Yeah, four, right through that floor, yeah. A $400,000 house became $100,000 in a place yeah. called Woodbridge, Virginia, Northern Virginia. And so even though we were at 50% LTV, the community bank levered us with a capital call. So we had to come up with a half a million bucks, which, oh, by the way, was a lot of money to us. So we had to come up with a half a million bucks in a short period of time. But just how luck has it, I wouldn't call it luck, right? I mean, luck is knowing what to do with an opportunity. We ended up becoming REO agents, real estate owned agents. And we ended up having all these relationships across the country with asset management companies between me and my partner, Sam. And so we ended up selling four or 500 houses in a two year period of time. And so if you can imagine the commissions on selling, you know, 3% or even two and a half percent, you know, 500 houses at an average sales price of $300,000, that's a lot of money. Well, luckily for us, that was ongoing as we had this $500,000 capital call. And so we paid the bank, the capital, we, you know, we re got our repurposed the loans, much lower LTV once the properties, you know, went up in value. And so we had to do that. And so that was a very stressful period in our time. But we had so many listings though, that my phone would not stop ringing from seven in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. And so we had relationships and we were a small broker and we had relationships with all the big boys, Remaxes of the world, Long and Foster, Century 21. In our area is a group called Weikert. And so all of the sign calls that were out there, I just referred them out to other agents. We didn't have time to deal, deal with the buy, buy calls. And so we referred every one of those. I, I literally would just write down one day I would have 40 calls of just buy leads that I would write down in my notebook. And I would summate this thing into an email, launch it and just forget about it. Yeah. You had to focus on what was most mission critical to your business, right. your success, your survival right. and outsource the rest. It's a delegate right. or die, right? That's exactly right. And then what happened was, is once the banks stopped dumping, once the banks stopped taking the houses back, like there was a certain time, there was a certain age built of a house. So let's say the house was 1960, 1978, 1979 built. Instead of taking it back in their REO department, real estate owned, mm -hmm. they were dumping them at the courthouse steps. So then what I started doing was not only were we, now we are, okay, so now we're fixing and flipping houses still. We have that small rental portfolio where REO agents, now what we're going to do is I'm showing up at the courthouse steps and I'm buying houses because the banks are basically giving up on the REO because they're spending too much money on rekeying it, on landscaping it, on keys for cash for the occupants, on trash outs, utility bills, HOA bills. They were spending way too much money. So they started dumping them at the courthouse steps. So then what we started doing is buying these houses at the courthouse steps. And so in one year, we, we bought one house a week. And so we bought about 52 houses in one year and, and fix and flipped them. Meanwhile, we're doing everything else. And so we then really killed it in the fix and flip. We started building a rental portfolio from, this was back in 2009-10. So from 2009-10 to about 2013, we went from a six unit rental portfolio to about 50 residential rentals. Because then what happened was our model was to keep the owners in their properties. Because even though we owned the house, it was still their home. And so because they had these bad loan products, some of them at the time were paying, let's say $2,500 or $2,600 a month in payments, which they couldn't afford because they had no income. They acted like they had income because they didn't have to disclose it. The Nina, no income, no asset verification, no income, right? And so they didn't have that much income. So what we did is we showed up and their payment, let's say 25, 2,600 bucks, we said, okay, you guys can stay here as long as the property was clean. If the landscape looked good and once they opened that front door, first of all, they had to answer. So once they opened the front door and I saw that the house was clean, we we're like, hey, I've got a deal for you. 
Um, we bought your house at a foreclosure sale. We're gonna, we want to keep you in here as tenants. If you're willing to stay, we understand it's, it's your home. We're going to reduce it a thousand bucks a month or whatever it was. Do you want to stay? And so, you know, we built up our portfolio that way. And most of these folks stayed. That's great. Again, sticking with your philosophy of solving a problem, meeting a need and creating a business around that. Well, it seems like you've always been opportunistic. You've always been looking out for where the right Mo where you could strike at any moment to, to create value. And it's like you said, you didn't have a business plan, but you ended up evolving your way into a very sound one and are doing a lot of different things and very diversified now. And that's really a reflection of the real estate business as a whole, right? Many people don't really know how broad the field of real estate is in general. And you look at you and me, we're both in the real estate industry, but you're in residential investing and lending and, and rentals. And I'm in commercial development, predominantly in the retail sector. For me, residential real estate is a complete mystery. I've consciously chosen to stay away from it completely in my career. But for you, it's it's your bread and butter. What was it that you think that were the factors that led you and, and your partners to residential real estate in particular? And what has made it the right fit for you for all these years? Well, you know, it's funny because I'm starting to inch into your world over, over periods of time. I mean, we've started acquiring a few more commercial assets and just simply added them into the into the uh, residential size. I guess the reason why we did residential was because I felt that number one, I understood the whole whole residential space. I understood mortgages. I understood finance. I understood distress assets. I understood the retail side of it. And, you know, one of the games that we liked playing growing up uh, was simply Monopoly. And so when somebody asked me what I do, if I don't really know them that well, you know, and I want to give them a quick answer, I just basically say, um, I play Monopoly for a living. That's what I do. And then if they ask more questions and I start to explain to them exactly what we do to not tell them too much and blow their minds away. Um, and so that's why we chose to do residential. And also too, more importantly, is that we didn't have any money when we started. We probably had the education, but my first actual pre-foreclosure purchase was a townhouse that I got. And the reason why I got it was because I had a good engineering job. I had good credit. And so what I did is I, but I didn't have much money. You know, I had two kids at the time. And so I was going through a, um, you know, a separation divorce at the time. And so I was supporting two households, uh, had some liquid assets, but not much. But what I did have is I had credit cards. I had credit card lines. So do you remember the gold cards? Yeah. Where you would go and apply for, let's say a $20,000 gold card and they would give you a $20,000 cash limit with a caveat that you were going to pay a three to five cash advance fee. So what I had was I had a bunch of, I had about $300,000 worth of gold card lines that I could access. I had maybe 10 or 12,000 in the bank. I don't even remember. And so what happened was, um, and I'd been going through the pre-foreclosures, right? This is before I really met my partners. And so I'd been going through the pre-foreclosure ads and I knocked on a door of a teacher that lived in Ohio and this was in Virginia and he was, ended up being homesick. And so I knocked on the door and said, Hey, such and such, your house is going to foreclosure in two weeks. And he only owned like 130,000 on it. The house was worth 200,000. I said, you know, I'd like to buy your house, you know, all cash next week. Can I do that? And so then he goes, uh, yeah, you can do it. And so I was like, um, I don't know what to do. So then I said to him, I said, what do you do for a living? He told me he was a teacher. We talked for another 20 minutes. I said, I will be back tomorrow when you're off of school at the same exact time and I'll have a contract for you to fill out and sign. And so then I was like freaking out saying, oh no, what do I do? I had a, a good friend of mine, uh, Dan Berinsky was Esquire Settlements. I said, Dan, I said, can you please pull title in this house and tell me what the encumbrances are? So at least I know what to offer. I go to, you know, even though I'm a realtor, right? I have to disclose that I'm a licensed agent. But I went to Staples. Uh, you might know it as Staples or Office Depot or, you know, one of these kinds of uh, business places. I got my, I literally got myself a three page contract in their legal section, even though I could have used one of the canned realtor contracts. So I get a three three page uh, contract. We just fill it out. At that time, Dan came back with the title search, so I knew the encumbrances. And so I just basically offered him ten thousand dollars more than his encumbrances, and and gave him you know rent free until he had to finish school, finish teaching school. And that's great how deal that for you, great deal for him. Yeah, right, great deal. And then that helped me start to build the, what we call the churn, right? The home equity line of credit. We I, you know got the house for about 135 or something. Houses were 200,000. I've got built in equity. Once the housing market started going up even a little bit more, right? I created the home equity line of credit to get more liquidity for me. And so that just started the ball rolling downhill. Yeah. It's a, it's a great story. I mean, I, I loved, you know, how you started from the ground up and, you know, working in the commercial space at the beginning of my career, we're dealing with the same things, just kind of in a different scale. 
and I've told the story before on Datages that you know my partner and I at the beginning of our careers we were each three million dollars in debt, and it's highly motivating uh, to say the least to work your way through that and get to the other side. And that's really what comes back to you know the story you're telling, the story I'm telling are so much in line with this notion and the Datage. It takes credit to make money. And the point we made in the previous episode on the topic was that, you know, a lot of people think it takes money to make money, but that I've referred to that as a limiting fallacy. You don't actually need your own money to get started in business. You just need to establish credibility and credit to be able to get money from another source. In your case, it was all these gold cards. And I, I took you know, this is one of the core principles actually of your book. And one of the things that really resonated with me, you wrote in the book, and I'll quote here, most people don't get involved in real estate because they fear they don't have enough money. And can you tell us why that's a limiting fallacy and explain why credit is so much more important than having your own money when it based on your roadmap for real estate success? Well, no, that's a great question because anytime I speak to a group, whether it's how to find distressed assets, how to find the money, bid on subject to financing, how to build a rental portfolio, how to build some commercial assets. The first question I always ask the audience, I'd say, how many of you folks out there think that finding the money and investing in real estate is the hardest thing? And let's say it might be a group of 50 people. I'm not kidding you. 40 people raise their hand. Yeah, exactly. They all raise their hand. And yeah. so I have to explain to them that as long as you can find, whether it's a distress asset and financial distress, residential or commercial, mind you, whether it's a condition distress, as long as you can find that asset with equity, money will follow. And now this is before the time when we started this business, hard money lenders didn't exist. Mm -hmm. It was the subprime markets. Those guys existed in the subprime markets, but they were pretty much for investor, I mean, owner occupant folks, not investors. So hard money didn't exist. The wholesalers didn't exist. So back then, yeah, okay, maybe it was a little bit harder to find money. But now with all these hard money lenders out there, whether they're nationwide lenders or whether they're regional players. And so I always have to tell the folks that, that you guys are now in a different environment, that the money is easy as long as you can find the money. Yeah. And it seems like it's important to understand that there's not just one kind of money. There are a lot of different types of money out there. And we were fortunate enough on, on Datages to have Ken Honda as a guest, and he's now part of the Datages friends and family. And he talked to us about happy money, which is his book. And in your book, you talk about, as you were just mentioning, hard money and soft money. Can you explain the differences between soft and hard money for the friends and family and why it's important to understand both? Oh, great question. Okay. So hard money, that term says the lender is going to lend on the hard asset. So the asset has to stand up on its own. So for example, I'm doing a fix and flip, right? The after repair value is, let's say it's $500,000 and you're buying it for $300,000 and it needs a $50,000 renovation. Well, the hard money guys will lend you 70% of the after repair value, hence 50, 500,000 times 70 is 350. So they're going to lend on the hard asset. Some will check credit. Uh, we don't check credit because the asset has to stand up on its own. Your renovation budget, if you say it's 50, it had better be 50 and you had better be able to execute. And if you can't execute, we'll help you out. Now on the hard money side, the interest rates and points are going to be a little bit higher. So we don't focus in on the borrower like a normal bank would do. We don't really check credit. I don't really have you fill out an application. I, I, I'm more concerned about your asset. Yeah, you're smart enough from your own experience as a fixer and flipper to be focused on the asset itself. And you have the capability, unlike a bank, that if you got to step in and take it over, you can handle that and you can create the value yourself if the borrower fails to do so. That's exactly right. And so the other thing that I tell borrowers is this, I say, don't be offended. I care about your contractor more than I care about you. Because at the end of the day, your contractor is going to be my loss mitigation because it's I've already done- perform. Yeah. yeah, I've already done the numbers. They got to perform and I got to make yeah. sure that, you know, I want you to make money. The most important thing is for our borrower to make money. And so I got to ensure that you're going to make money. And so I do care about the contractor more. Now, the converse to that, and I wouldn't really say converse, because if you're in the investing space, you need to build established relationships with banks. And so if you're smaller guys like us, we deal with what's called community banks. Community banks are back in the old days called savings and loans. They're the relationship banks. You show up, you shake some hands, you know, you get to meet, meet them, you get to understand what their uh, product types are. And so one of the things that we did with the community banks, HALA, soft money, and the terminology of soft money comes from, they do care about the asset, 
but the asset is maybe 30% of that equation. They care about you as a borrower. They care about your credit. They care about your, what I call bankability. Do you have a balance sheet? Do you have an income statement? Do you have a track record? Are your corporate documents are lined up? You know, what are you as a borrower, right? So they really care uh, more about you as a borrower than they would be the asset. And that's soft money. The difference between soft and hard money is the soft money rates are going to be a lot less than the hard money rate. So let's say, for example, on the hard money side, I charge 12% and three points. One point is 1% of the loan amount. Soft money all depend upon where we are in the interest rate environment. They might be down to like 7% and a half a point. So the interest rate's going to be a, a lot less. The points are going to be a lot less. But even though they have all of your information personally, they're going to want you to put 20 to 25% down as a down payment. And so they're going to make you put up a lot more cash out of your pocket, hence the term soft money. Yeah. And you said in the book, that one of the first steps in the process uh, when it comes to financing a real estate venture is to understand your own credit. Uh, and it sounds like that is really fundamental to this determining, do you go down the route of hard money or soft money or both and where you lean on the two legs of that equation? Can you explain further for somebody who's at the very, very beginning of this process, how can they understand their own credit and how the lenders might look at it through their lens? All right. Well, that's a great question. And we'll talk about a couple of things. The first one is we're going to talk about bankability. Bankability, meaning how bankable are you as a borrower? And they want to know how you're organized. So the first thing that they're going to check is they're going to check your credit. They want to understand how organized you are in your personal financial self, right? And I'm assuming you're a beginner. So you're not, even if you have an LLC, an LLC has what's called a Dun & Bradstreet rating on your LLC. It's kind of like your LLC credit. But if you're just starting your LLC, you're not going to have any, right? No credit. So they're going to focus on your credit, your personal credit. They're going to want to understand what you've been doing in the last five years. They're also going to want to understand your tax returns. Are you organized enough? Have you been doing your tax returns on an annual basis? The next thing they're going to want to see is, well, what is your budget? What's your home budget look like? And we call that an income statement. So for us, we'll have an income statement on the company side. We'll have an income statement on my personal side, which you can call a budget. And then they're going to want to see what's called your PFS, personal financial statement, which is your assets and your liabilities and it calculates your net worth. They're not really looking to see, obviously they kind of want to see a above zero net worth, but they understand that if you're a beginner, you might not have an above zero net worth. You might have student loans, you might have car loans, you might have all this kind of stuff. But what they're really looking for is how organized are you? And more importantly, even if you're a beginner, they're going to want you because they're going to want to establish a long-term relationship with you as a beginner. Because if you become a successful real estate investor, and that's what I tell people all the time on our hard money side, we love beginners because the beginner, if they can find that good deal, there's only one word to tell these guys, and that's yes. And we're going to help them execute. We're going to help them pick out fixtures. We're going to help them with what paint. We're going to help them with general contractors because the thing that I understand is that you're only a beginning investor for your first deal. And your first deal is going to turn into 20 or 30 deals. And I want to be alongside the way on your 30th deal. And that's just the way we look at it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, for these folks that are beginners, one of the things that I find a lot of times, I'm sure you see this when you're talking to people who are looking into the industry as well, is a fear of debt. In some cases, people are uncomfortable with the notion of owing somebody else money. But if you haven't borrowed money, you don't have credit. That's one of the paradoxes is that if you're wanting to put money to work, you need to have gone out and borrowed money and established a credit history. I think a lot of people are very allergic to that. And I think that it really is a barrier to them getting into this type of opportunity and something that they have to overcome as a mindset. Is that something you see a lot of? Yeah, well, you hit the nail on the head, right? It's all about the mindset. You've got, and I always tell people, you got to be relentless. You know, we're pitching the book Relentless, right? Tim Grover, you have to be relentless. And so one of the things that we're always telling people is that there's good debt and there's bad debt. You have to understand your tranches of bad debt, right? It's all about the consumer debt. Whether you have that, the credit cards, you know, your Best Buy, all of your department store cards, you know, you want to use, you want to borrow money off of your home equity line of credit to take some sort of $20,000 European vacation. You got to understand what good debt and bad debt is. And so for us, good debt is always any debt that I can get at a certain interest rate on real estate, right? We love debt on real estate because we used our debt on real estate to further leverage our hard money uh, business. Because if if it wasn't for community banks, soft money, wanting to put certain lines of credit on top of our equity in our rental portfolio, we wouldn't have been able to grow our hard money side. So 
you have to know how to use good real estate leverage debt to your advantage and don't use it for consumables and consumer spending. And because that's where most people got into trouble in the 2007, eight timeframe as they took all this equity in their properties on the buildup and they spent it on vacations. They spent it on consumable debt. And then once the market tanked, they were upside down. Go buy a bunch of dumb stuff rather than putting the money into something that has a return attached to it. Well, let's stick with the, uh, as you said, sixth grade level of discussion. I want to cover a couple more sort of fundamental basics for people in the friends and family that may be in the group that is just getting started or has an interest in real estate. We'll pick up right there with Charlie Einsman in part two of this interview on the next episode of Datages. Don't miss it. You'll learn a lot more about Charlie's proven system for wealth creation, and we'll also get personal with Charlie about dad stuff. Until then, remember, dad may not always know what he's talking about, but he sure can sound like he does. 